Hello, you are watching India Global with me, Parmeshwar Bhava, on NDTV 24/7. Now, as the United States appears to be nearing a deal to cut spending and raise the debt ceiling, we look at how this impacts us in India. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister has been on a diplomatic roll this week. We get your ground report from Australia's Little India and an exclusive with Australia's first Lord Mayor of Indian origin. All this and more lined up for you on this episode. Let's begin with the headlines. U.S. debt ceiling talks under crunch time, with the deadlock persisting and the 1st of June deadline looming large. But the U.S. President Joe Biden still remains confident. I've made clear time and again that falling on our national debt is not an option. The question is, will India weather the storm if the U.S. stares a default? And ahead of Prime Minister Modi's first state visit to Washington next month, the U.S. State Department says the war in Ukraine is high on the Biden-Modi bilateral agenda. The meeting comes after Prime Minister Modi's assurance to President Zelensky at the G7 meet in Hiroshima last week that India will do all it can to support Ukraine and encourage peace. Australia gets its own Little India. Sydney's Harris Park has been renamed Little India. We get you an exclusive with Australia's first Lord Mayor of Indian origin. Well, the United States has reached their limit of national debt to 106.7% of its GDP as in relation to the size of the economy. The parties in US Congress have been at loggerheads over debt ceiling negotiations. But the question is, will India weather the storm if the US stares a default? Here's our report. The world's biggest economy could run out of cash and default on its debt for the first time ever. What is the US debt ceiling and why does it matter? Well, the US Congress first introduced the debt ceiling, the upper limit of the money that the government could borrow back in 1917. The measure meant the government no longer needed approval from lawmakers over every debt issued. Now, over the past seven decades, the debt ceiling has been raised a whopping 78 times. But defaulting on the debt is simply not an option. Our economy would fall into recession. It would devastate retirement accounts, increase borrowing costs, and according to Moody's, nearly 8 million Americans would lose their jobs and their international reputation would be damaged in the extreme if we were to let that happen. We should find ways that we cap the amount of spending going out late because the Democrats had spent so much. How would a debt default impact the global economy? In short, a U.S. default could spark a global economic crisis. The Treasury Department has predicted that the U.S. government would begin to run out of funds as early as the 1st of June, a move that would have far-reaching consequences for the U.S. and the global economy. The lack of funds would force the U.S. Treasury to likely prioritize spending so that debt payments and interest payments are made first. That could mean delays to the payments of salaries of tens of millions of public sector workers in the U.S., social security payments and healthcare subsidies to older and vulnerable Americans could also be put on hold. An analysis by Biden's economic advisors has warned that even a brief default would cost the U.S. economy 5 lakh jobs. They believe a protracted default would send their GDP plunging by 6% with the loss of tens of thousands of businesses. But in a worst-case scenario, the U.S. would have to stop borrowing altogether by July or August, which would send further shockwaves through global financial markets and tip the rest of the world into a deep recession. A more serious default would cause a sharp decline in the US dollar, causing chaotic fluctuations in exchange rates and spiking the prices of oil and other commodities as well. A US default would generate an economic and financial catastrophe. Over the past few years, American families and businesses, including many of yours, have worked hard to mount an historic economic recovery. And a default would reverse all of the hard-earned progress that we have made. How will the debt ceiling impact us in India? If the U.S. defaults, we are likely to feel the jitters here. The U.S. default could lead to a sharp fluctuation in domestic currency markets and put stress on equity markets as well. If there's a recession in the U.S. economy, then our export demand would be affected. On the other hand, if the commodity prices drop because of the recession, that would help you know, control inflation in India. 
so in other words there could be some positive effect the dollar would weaken the rupee would strengthen a little bit but as the us president continues talks history seems to back him the us has always managed to raise its debt ceiling 78 times in the 63 years since the us congress first enacted the debt limit 49 times under republican presidents and 29 times under democratic presidents Speaker McCarthy and I have had several productive conversations and our staffs continue to meet as we speak as a matter of fact and they're making progress. I made clear time and again the falling on our national debt is not an option. And joining us now is Voice of America White House Bureau Chief Patsy Vera Kuswara. Well Patsy it sounds like we are maybe starting to see some signs of momentum towards a deal in the US. But how close are the two sides really? Well, as we speak, both the White House and Republicans in Congress are still trying to hammer out a deal down to the last minute. You know, there is still a lot of issues to be worked through, but there are signs of progress. However, I must stress that even if an agreement is achieved, it still takes some time to put that plan into action. Uh Congress has to review it and then they also have to put it through the process. So it may not happen even if a deal is reached today or tomorrow or sometimes during the weekend. It may not uh happen soon enough before the so-called X date and that is the date when the US Treasury says that they may be running out of money to pay for all their obligations and their debts and their bills and also remember that right now in the US this weekend and also Monday is a holiday weekend so members of Congress are being sent home uh also with a notice to return to Washington if a deal is struck so there's a lot of things going on a lot of balls in the air and of course it's a very nervous time time for both people in Washington in the United States and also for global finance overall. Right Patsy also you know once the US Treasury is unable to pay the bills on time markets as we know will start to react immediately. Now experts are saying that if it's a week the US is definitely in a recession if it's more than a few weeks it's a deep downturn for the US. What is your analysis? Well the short answer to that question is we don't know. I mean I've spoken to so many analysts who say that we actually don't know. I mean we have our suspicion obviously the US is the biggest economy in the world. The dollar is a benchmark for many currencies and many many other economies borrow a lot uh, our investors of US debt, you know, both China, Japan, also India buys a lot of US treasury bonds and of course all of these will be affected all of these countries all of these markets will be affected but just how badly it will be affected that's a big unknown because this has never happened before as you know the US has inched towards a debt crisis a debt ceiling crisis several times before the latest in 2017 in 2013 2011 but we've never gone past the brink so we really don't know what's going to happen having said that you know both the US, uh both the administration the white house president joe biden as well as congressional republicans both say that they are not seeking or they really are working their best to avoid this so-called uh you know debt ceiling crisis uh this so-called default on the US uh of its obligations so there are some signs of uh a convergence between the two sides including perhaps a freeze on government spending which is what the republicans want for a period of up to 2 years uh with the raising of the debt ceiling until 2024 after the president election so this the presidential election so these are all just ideas that are being cooked out and hammered into by both sides but still there is no clear signs no clear path at this point that there's going to be an agreement having said that both sides are saying that there will be an agreement and the US will avoid a default whether or not it can happen in time that's still a big question Thank you so much Patsy Vira Kuswara for joining us with that quick update that is Voice of America's correspondent White House bureau chief joining us with a quick update on the debt ceiling negotiations with that let's turn our attention now to whether India can broker a peace deal between Russia and Ukraine Prime Minister Modi speaking to Ukraine's president in Japan had said India will do whatever it can to bring a resolution to the war Now this is in line with previous Indian statements regarding the need to end the war and another reminder that India opposes the war even though we've taken a muted position so far. But ahead of the Prime Minister's state visit to Washington next month, the US says the war in Ukraine will certainly be one of the topics that is under discussion. This has triggered speculation that New Delhi could possibly play the role of peacemaker in Russia's invasion in Ukraine. Listen in to what US State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller had to say.
As far as Ukraine is concerned, India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi, he met uh, several leaders uh, at the G7 meetings, including President Biden and also, of course, uh, uh, President Zelensky and other leaders. Uh, you think when he arrives in Washington next month, uh, because he has spoken in the past about the war between Russia and Ukraine, that India could be, or Narendra Modi, Prime Minister Narendra Modi could be the uh, one who can break the ice or uh, mediator. Uh, you think uh, he can play a role when he comes to Washington after meeting, when he meets uh, with the Prime Minister, President Biden and, of course, the Secretary of State and other leaders? So I would say without giving too much of a preview of that trip, which we will do as the, the state visit gets closer, um, uh, certainly uh, the war in Ukraine will be one of the topics um, uh, that is under discussion. It's been one of the topics that's been under discussion in, in previous meetings with Prime Minister Modi, as it uh, is in just about any conversation we have with a world leader. Uh, at this time or has been the case for the past year. Right, to further discuss this, Michael Kugelman, the South Asia Institute Director from the Wilson Center, joins us live. Thank you, Michael, for your time. Michael, what's your take? Can India play the role of a mediator in this ongoing war? And is Putin likely to listen to his friend Modi? Well, I think that India is certainly a strong candidate. Uh, there are not many of them, but it certainly is a strong candidate to be a mediator. Uh, it has, of course, good relations with Ukraine and a very special partnership with Russia. And few other countries have such a long special relationship with Russia. India has a track record of managing or balancing tough relationships, tough rivalries like the Saudis and the Iranians, and of course the U.S. and Russia. And I would argue that India does have some leverage over Russia because India continues to be a key uh, buyer of arms and energy from Russia. Um, and indeed, uh, the prime minister has suggested uh, at least once that Putin and Zelensky have a, have a direct conversation. But I do think what you say is significant in that in order for this to be successful, uh, you know, both sides would obviously have to be willing to subject themselves to a mediation. And I just don't know if Putin at this point in time would be ready to talk about de-escalating and, and, uh, and ending the war. You know, you'd have to think that uh, Putin's few friends, um, one of those friends is the president of China. And one would think that the Chinese president has also sought to get uh, Putin to de-escalate. It hasn't happened. We've seen that Russia is not willing to do that yet. And that may give India pause, quite frankly, before it's willing to make an offer of mediation. If it thinks it's not going to be successful, maybe it would feel better to hold off until the conditions are better to make that big attempt. But absolutely, I do think India should be seen as a very strong candidate to be a mediator uh, to end this terrible war. Right. Thank you so much, Michael, for joining us with that quick comment. That was Michael Kugelman joining us with whether India stands a real chance to play the peacemaker between Russia and Ukraine. With that, let's turn our attention now to Australia. The Prime Minister, along with his Australian counterpart, announced the renaming of Harris Park, a suburb in Sydney, as Little India. Indians in Australia, who have always considered the Harris Park area as their home, are ecstatic. Take a look at our ground report. Prime Minister Narendra Modi and Australian Prime Minister Albanese unveiling the plaque on Little India opening a new chapter for the diaspora from India. Harris Park Kai logo ke liye Harish Park ho jata hai. Indians in Australia who have always considered Harris Park area as their home are ecstatic and the icing on the cake is the election of Sandeep Pandey as Paramatta's first Lord Mayor of Indian origin. So you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, Harris Park has been called um, Little India. So the idea is to brand it as uh, Little India. Like we have in New York, we have Little Italy. Like in city of Sydney, we have um, Little, uh, we have Chinatown. So there's a number of uh, places, precincts again, um, which are branded in such a way which will attract tourism. And that's the idea again here that we create Little India um, as national and international destination. Paramatta is home to nearly 53.3% of people who were born overseas. Slightly over 29,000 people in Paramatta area of Indian are of Indian origin. China follows close. Both countries account for 11.3% each of Paramatta's population. 
Harris Park, now christened Little India, is the first port of call for Indians before they move out to other areas in Sydney. From groceries found back home to a desi cut in local barber shop, it's literally Little India. Initially, we had six stores in Sydney. Now, we have more than Sanjay Deshwal, president of the Little India Harris Park Business Association, relived the journey from Harris Park to Little India. Harris Park and Parameta were not safe suburbs at the time. People used to come here, there would be like people who would rob them or pickpocket them. It was not safe areas. And I've seen the transformation from a very sleepy suburb. Today, Parameta is the fastest growing city all over Australia. We got this opportunity, came up in Little India and uh, as an Indian background, you know, like we always wanted uh, something, you know. Uh, like you know especially this area so it was growing and uh, uh, we got this opportunity to open an Indian restaurant like you know so we just um, um, try to make it like Indo-Italian kind of fusion here so जब मैं फर्स्ट टाइम यहाँ आई हैरिस पार्क तो यहाँ पे टोटली ऐसा था कि कि हम लोग ऑस्ट्रेलिया में नहीं हैं कि हम लोग इंडिया में ही घूम रहे हैं यहाँ पे आपको गुजराती मिलेंगे पंजाबी मिलेंगे नेपाली है मतलब लाइक सब सब लोग हैं यहाँ पे तो यहाँ पे आके एक ऐसी फीलिंग आती है कि लाइक आप लोग इंडिया में हो कोई ऐसे नहीं आता फीलिंग कि हाँ भी ऑस्ट्रेलिया है या कुछ है लाइक यहाँ पर अपना मन लगता है यहाँ आने के बाद like most Indian students studying overseas, youngsters like Priyanka, who see Australia as their future home, don't have it easy. And with the global recession fueled by the pandemic, as well as the Russia-Ukraine crisis, the cost of living has spiraled globally and odd jobs too are harder to come by. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, but like uh, according to me in starting stages like for uh, five to six years it, it uh, I find difficult like uh, to live in Australia a uh, better life. We got like one register full of uh, uh, the name, contact details, you know like people are keep coming in looking for jobs. Every day like we like 25 to 30 students come and like you know everybody needs job. So yeah it's pretty pretty hard on them. So. And for some like Ruhani, who made a career in singing, life is coming a full circle. Kind of be like the bridge um, that connects, you know, the two worlds um, and then make them one. Uh, so I think going back to India for me would a, I guess, yeah, I mean, I want to, you know, stick to my roots. I want to stay grounded um, and I think going back to where it all started. Prime Minister Narendra Modi's three-day visit to Australia this week coincided with a year since Labour Party leader Anthony Albanese was elected Prime Minister and gave a fillip to growing bipartisan ties. But it was the celebration as well as the concerns of the Indian origin community that appeared to overshadow all else. Prime Minister Modi said that the real reason the real power behind the bilateral relations came from people of Indian origin in Australia. In fact, the City of Parramatta Council in Sydney, New South Wales, has elected Councillor Samir Pandey as its new Lord Mayor, making him the first Lord Mayor of Indian origin in the city's history. Samir Pandey's election to the post coincided with the Prime Minister's arrival in Sydney, and he joins us live at the moment on NDTV. Thank you so much for joining us, Samir. Now, you are Parramatta's first elected Indian well, origin <laughs> Lord Mayor, as we know, Parramatta is home to a vibrant and diverse community from South Asia. It also just got a little India now. It is the geographical heart of Greater Sydney and a major economic powerhouse. How exactly do you feel? I feel very humbled. I feel um, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's humbling for me, but also for the community. It's a, it's a matter of pride for um, the entire Indian diaspora here. Uh, I think... Uh, it's something which uh, has taken a while. I think um, we have quite a few politicians, but uh, um, to get the top job at City of Parramatta is something which uh, 
um, is uh, very humbling and a privilege um, for me. Right, you touched upon this briefly, but the footprint of the Indian diaspora is quite significant in Australia. We've seen the crowds that just turned up for the Prime Minister's event in Sydney. But how is the relationship between our two leaders viewed locally in Australia? I think people have um, take pride in the relationship that we have. People pay, take pride in the people-to-people -people relationship that we have between Australia and India. Um, uh, in the past year or two, uh, I would say a number of Indian uh, politicians uh, and federal um, ministers have visited Sydney, which has strengthened, again, the relationship. Uh, there has been a number of uh, pact and agreements which has been signed um, locally as well. There is an uh, announcement of uh, establishment of a centre for Australia-India relations, which is funded by the government here. And all those things shows and reflects on the, the strong relationship and bond that Australia has with India. Right, you've also repeatedly laid emphasis on smart cities, but just touching upon our new mobility and migration pact that both our countries have signed, we are expecting more Indian students to travel to Australia now for further studies and for employment opportunities. How do you plan to ensure that they thrive in a safe environment? In the past, uh, I am talking about several years ago, there has been concerns, but at this stage there is no, um, I do not see any concerns in terms of um, the safety of Indian students. I think the government does recognize that there has been um, issues in the past and this is we are talking about a uh, while ago. Um, at this stage um, we interact with quite a few students um, and uh, their conditions are quite uh, um, good. Um, the jobs are there, uh, the education obviously there is, um, education is a, is a massive uh, um, factor in terms of economy uh, in Australia. So the government has focused on the safety of the students um, welfare of the students, that's a top priority for a lot of local government as well as state and federal government here in uh, Australia. So I don't see that there is uh, uh, concerns um, in that space at this stage. Right. Also, is there a plan in place to ensure Indian students who eventually study in Australia have a chance to work there? Now, we know we are witnessing turbulent times as far as the global economy is concerned, but in the backdrop of that, is Australia a safe bet for Indians who are looking to make Australia their home? Yes, indeed. Um, I think uh, the government, the students who come here, they have a visa category where they can um, stay back and work for a certain period of time. And I think a lot of students, they take advantage of that. They stay back and they can work full time. So that's that's option is there. Um, also, the visa process has, stay, uh, has changed a bit if you look, look back from last five, ten years. Uh, but still there are several um, areas in demand where students can study and then have a pathway towards permanent residency. Um, while studying as well, they have, op they, have uh, they legally can work for a certain number of hours, um, which is changing now. It's full time now, but that will change to um, 20 hours a week um, uh, in the next coming few weeks. Uh, but there is, there is uh, plenty of uh, jobs. Uh, for international, international students. Um, the unemployment here is almost at its lowest, which means that people do find jobs and, uh, um, and that's one good thing about uh, Sydney. There is plenty of jobs. Right. Samir here is wishing you the best of luck as you lead the council of one of the fastest growing centres in Australia. It was a pleasure speaking to you. Thank you so much for joining us on NDTV. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all we could pack in this episode of India Global. We'll be back next week. Do stay tuned.